Hello everyone, welcome back. This video will be an update to my alkali metal project, which I've been working on slowly over the last couple months. In my last video on this subject, many of you left me comments with ideas to improve the process for creating both sodium and potassium, and I've tried several of those, which I will show you in this video. The most frequent suggestion that I received was to separate the chambers in my electrolysis setup so that the oxygen formed at the anode would be separated from the sodium that forms at the cathode. I already did have it on my mind to try this, so the first thing I did was to make a small vessel out of angle iron with a divider in it that doesn't quite touch the bottom, so there's room for electrolyte to still pass underneath. You can see I did have somewhat favorable results, but surprisingly, they weren't all that much better than an undivided chamber. In this case, the solution is turning this dark green color because on the suggestion of some patents I found online, I've switched the anode out for a nickel-plated rod. I also tried some other electrode materials, including copper. This also worked fairly well, but nothing special over steel. The most interesting method I've found so far for creating alkali metals is the reduction of the metal's carbonate with carbon. My first attempts to conduct this reaction utilized my spiral flame torch contained in a soup can with a steel crucible above. I filled this crucible with some potassium carbonate along with an excess amount of charcoal powder. This requires a lot of heat, well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. While the torch was hot enough to melt some of the potassium carbonate, it wasn't quite hot enough to get the reaction started. I decided to change the setup to utilize a much hotter heat source, in this case an arc furnace utilizing carbon rods from a lantern battery and a fire brick as the housing. Grant Thompson has put together an excellent tutorial on how to make a furnace similar to this, so I won't repeat the process here. You can find a link to his video in the video description below. The biggest change that I made from Grant's design was to drill a hole into the top of the furnace to contain a ceramic crucible, which I will use to contain my potassium carbonate and charcoal. An arc welder is the power supply that is used to heat this furnace, and the graphite electrodes are one of the few materials in the world that can withstand the extremely high temperatures that are created within. Inside of the furnace, an electrical arc creates a superheated plasma, which heats the ceramic crucible from below. This is a clip of my very first attempt. At this point, I had no idea whether or not it would work. The first thing that happens is some of the charcoal begins burning in the air. I knew this would happen, which is why I used more charcoal than was necessary. As the crucible heats further, eventually we start to see bright purple plumes coming out of the surface. Even after I take away the heat, you can see that these potassium plumes are still formed for a short while while the reaction vessel remains hot. This is a huge success, and I'm thrilled with this experiment, but there's still a big problem. The reaction is so hot that the potassium metal is formed as a gas, and I need to figure out a way to distill it back into a liquid and then a solid before it burns up in the air. This is the first setup that I thought to try a piece of black iron pipe suspended over the opening of the crucible so the potassium vapor will have to flow through it and hopefully condense on the walls. To make sure that the pipe remains cold enough to condense the potassium, I wrapped it in a damp rag. I then conducted the reaction in the same way as the first time, heating the crucible from below. Besides potassium, the other product of this reaction is CO2, so I'm hoping that will also fill the pipe and act as a shielding gas. Once it seemed like the reaction had completed, I removed my pipe and capped one end to prevent oxygen from getting inside. On the other side, I set a cap upside down over the opening, which will also protect from oxygen, but at the same time allow gas inside the pipe to vent if it's still being pressurized. My plan at this point was to mount the pipe in my vise at an angle and then heat it with my torch so that the potassium that hopefully is lining the sides will remelt and run down into the end cap. As it was cooling, I poured some mineral oil in from the far end with the thought that that should protect any potassium metal that collected in the end cap. And with that, it's time to check my results. I'm not seeing any potassium in here, just oxides. I'm not really sure where to go next with this setup. 
If you have any suggestions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. The very last experiment I'll show in this video is a catalyzed replacement reaction between magnesium and potassium hydroxide. This has become a pretty well-known method for producing small quantities of metallic potassium. It's conducted under a high boiling solvent. In this case, I'm using a 70-30 ratio of paraffin wax and naphtha. The catalyst is tertiary butyl alcohol, which is added over the course of several hours as the reaction progresses. This experiment is rather particular about what solvent you use, and I didn't have much success with my paraffin and naphtha solution, though I may not have let it go on for long enough. When working with potassium, you have to be very careful not to allow potassium superoxide to form, which is a black oxide and a high explosive. I was concerned that this superoxide might be forming in solution, which is why I stopped my experiment early. So those are all the updates I have so far on this series. Like I said, if you have any recommendations, be sure to leave them in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.